Amen. Perform the mercy. I wanted to read from verse 67 to get some context of what's going on right here. It's, I think it's important to know who's speaking and why they're speaking. Because um, it has some... Uh, it has a lot to do with, with what, he's, what he's saying here. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Now, remember who Zacharias was. He was, he was a, uh, a priest, and remember he was ministering. This is six months or nine months earlier he was ministering in the, in the temple, at least nine months earlier. And um, he was visited by an angel and told him, this, told him uh, some wonderful words. Remember, he asked, how shall I know this will be accomplished? <laughs> and so he was, he was made dumb. You see, but he had said, because you didn't believe. You didn't believe my words. He says, so now you'll, you'll be dumb until, until this, the performance of the words that he gave you. All right, so here he is. This is nine months later. Remember, six months after that's when, when the angel appeared to Mary and gave her the word, and then she went, went to her... Uh, <laughs> to Elizabeth there, and the babe leaped in his womb. I always wondered why he waited six months. Of course, it was so the babe could leap in his womb. <laughs> the Lord does everything right. Amen. Does everything right. Does it at the right time. Amen. And um, here, you know, we, we've got this testimony now that, that Elizabeth's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, she spoke some good words after that. I like listening to people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. They always got something good to say. Amen. So I, I like submitting my mind to things, to people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what we're, today is what we're, we're given. We're given to hear something from a person who we know was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, um, she gave, gave birth, and eight days later, remember, she came to be circumcised, and they were going to call him Zacharias. Oh, we're gonna, and she said, no, his name's going to be John. And he said, there's nobody of your family that's of that name. Of course, Mary, I mean, those would probably said, well, there is now, right? There is now. John. But no, they didn't. They 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 beckoned, they motioned to, to Zacharias. You you tell us. So he took a writing tablet because he still couldn't talk, <laughs> and he said his name is John. His tongue was loosed at that moment. Boom, his tongue's loosed. Now what's he gonna say? His father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, "Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed." people. Now, you got to connect this now with what Zacharias, being filled with the Holy Spirit, we're not going to question what he says is right now, because he's filled with the Holy Spirit now. In other words, this is God talking through Zacharias. He's visited his people, raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he has spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which has been since the world began. God has never been without a message going out. He's always been talking. It's just whether or not we've been listening. That we should be saved from our enemies. Oh, now, now remember, he's going to link this. <laughs> he's going to link this. Eventually, he's going to get to it. He's going to link what he's saying about this salvation with what he gave to Abraham. Now, you're going to have to have some wisdom to make the connection. But the connection's there. All right, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Now, I never read anywhere where it said the law was his holy covenant. Can't, you can't find it in the scripture. It doesn't say that. All right, but this is what he's talking. He's talking about the performing, the performance in the remembrance of his holy covenant He's going to perform something. He's going to do something because he remembered an agreement, a covenant that he entered into yeah. with the fathers. Yeah. Now, see, this is important to understand what he's talking about here. You're going to have to, going to, have to re revisit what exactly did he say to these. All right? To remember his holy covenant, the oath. He made an oath. Yeah. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Oh, I like the way he singled Abraham out now. Now you'll find that when you go to research that, that God didn't give anything new to Isaac or Jacob. He gave it to Abraham. And then he told them, I'll honor what I gave to Abraham. I'll honor it to you because it was to his seed after him. All right? 
to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, what did he swear? That he would grant unto us. Oh, now he's brought it home, hadn't he? He would grant unto us. We're of Father Abraham. All right, well, what, what, why is he talking like this? Because he's, he, he's, Jesus is going to be born into a culture of people that know who they are. They know who they are. We're connected with Abraham. But whatever Abraham gets, we get. They believe that. I think today a lot of people don't believe that they're going to get what Jesus gets. They don't really know what. Amen. He would grant unto us to be delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Might serve him without fear. Without fear. In holiness and righteousness. Before him all the days of our life. And this couldn't happen. <laughs> this Abraham, he was looking for this. But he didn't get it, did he? See, Abraham, he was looking for something that was bigger than this world could give him. He knew it. He sensed it in him, in himself. See, you can't get close to God without kind of tuning in to what God's doing. This is bigger than this world. This is bigger than just giving me some land. Although he did do that. He did perform a lot of things. You're looking at perform. See, technically a promise is of no value if the person making the promise does not have, one, the ability... To, do, to, to be able to do what he said, or the actual intention to do it. See, Satan's a liar. He'll promise you something. He has no ability to do it at all. Amen. He really can't even make the promise. But he does it anyway because he's a liar. Yeah. He's a deceiver. So he'll, he'll lead you into thinking that, oh, this, there's a lot of pleasure in this. But he doesn't tell you that it's just for a season. He doesn't tell you that because he's a liar. God, on the other hand, God is the only one, and I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I don't care. God's the only one that can perform 100% of the time. He's the only one. Everything that God's ever said is going to happen is going to happen. The, the word perform, just a dictionary, it means to carry out, to fulfill, to execute, to accomplish, to do, grant, or give something promised. To actually come through with it. He's going to perform it now. I've been talking about it for 4,000 years. Now I'm going to perform it. In other words, see all the verily verilys there. He's getting, they're going to focus your attention on something. This is something that God, God's going to do something now. It's no time for sleeping right now. Zacharias went to home in bed. He was about doing the Lord's work. And what happened? Oh, boy. He was glad he went to work that day. Glad he didn't call off sick that day. Now, we'll find out real quick that the world's caught on to this thing about performance, about performing. See, you know, you can be a slacker in the world, but you're not going to be the one that people call on when they need something done. They're not. Even the business world knows this. They got their performance ratings. All right? They'll, they'll check... They got these things. They spend billions of dollars on finding out a way to better track the performance of their employees. Because, see, if they can do it successfully, they can rearrange people and they can have a company that's much more productive. So they caught on to this. We, don't, we wouldn't think that God any, does any less. He, he, he knows exactly what's in his people because he put it there. But the CEOs of businesses, um, <clears throat> now, see, they have to use wisdom. In judging the performability of any new venture, they have to look at it. They have to say, well, what will this do? How much, how much can we hope to gain if we want to jo do this new venture here? Well, see, God counted the cost of salvation. And what did he do? He sent his son to take away sin. It's what he did. Because uh, he knew exactly what he was. Known unto him are all his works from the very beginning. He, he knows that the son <coughs> would come and would perform. The mercy, see? He knew it. Now, a good performance rating, <clears throat> in business anyway, is very commendable. And yet a poor one, well, let's we'll put it this way. They're not going to be calling on you and saying, will you, will you watch over our empire? Yeah, we got billions of dollars invested in this, and we've called you up because we've seen that you're a very, very poor performance record. 
See, that's just foolish, isn't it? People would never do that. Well, then why would I call on someone to try to feed my soul who has absolutely no interest in what God's doing? And yet, Babylon's all about that, isn't it? They make them laugh. If I can make you laugh. I could find a place in Babylon if I could just make you laugh. Make you feel good about yourself. Smile a lot. Tell you everything's going to be all right. See, if you're known for never being able to do what you promise people, people won't really like you all that much. They may pretend, but... See, people don't want to hear that. People don't... They don't want to be lied to. It's just that um, we live in a world that people don't really have a choice. I mean, your performance rating, probably a 75, would probably be really good in the world, wouldn't it? 75% of the time, you come through with what you say. <clears throat> but did you know that even one time, even one, one time with God would make all of his promises null and void. If he ever failed even on one, then he couldn't be trusted. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to lean your soul on a God like that, would you? Because see, we, we, we've been taught from the very beginning <clears throat> that God is always true to what he says, even when it hurts. Now, we know that Adam and Eve, they were put in the garden. They were perfect. They didn't need anything. They, they, they were innocent. They didn't, there's no sin in their life. God gives them one thing, one thing. So what it says in Genesis 2.16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but he's only going to give him one thing now. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. If you eat of this tree, you will die. So don't do it. I see it seems reasonable, doesn't it? It's one tree. you got all these other trees to eat from. There's only one tree here. Don't eat of it. Because if you eat of it, you'll die. I mean, as a parent, wouldn't this be like make sense to warn the children, don't do this, because if you do this, you're going to die. You wouldn't think that I was a bad parent because I warned my children to not step out into the freeway. You would think that I was a responsible parent, doing the right thing for the children. But see, he gives them one thing, and what's the one thing? that Satan wants to, to tempt them to do. The one thing. Genesis 3, 9 says, The Lord called Adam, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you, Adam? Well, of course, he knew where he was at. He wanted Adam to know where he was at. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid. What happened? What happened between the last time I was here, speaking as a man, to now what happened? You weren't afraid of me the last time I was here. He said, I, I was afraid because I was naked. See, because I was naked, I hid myself. But, well, well, what happened? Well, God knew what happened. But see, sin had plunged men so far down, they weren't able anymore. When he ate of the tree, he died. This is what happened. Now, you know, we could go through all of, all, you know the record. They'd, they'd been tempted. So is God going to say, well, wait a minute, you, you know, you were perfect before. You were perfect. And, you know, I'm just going to restore you back to that perfect condition and everything will be okay. I'm going to, I'm going to rebuke the devourer for your sake. Is that what God does? But see, God had said something. God had said something that could not be overlooked. He told them, the day you eat of it, you're going to die. This couldn't be overlooked. And he says, he starts asking questions. God does this. God asks questions. He says, who told you you were naked? Where did you get this information from? You've been talking to somebody else? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou should not eat? Did you eat of that tree? Now, see, I went through a lot of this as, as a child. I went through a lot of this standing before my father. Had to answer him. Did you do what I said not to do? Now, you know, my father wouldn't have been a very good father if he'd have said, that's all right. It's all right. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I don't want to hurt your feelings. 
No, what happened was is the performance of the word. All of a sudden, God was right up in their face, so to speak, and the very word that he gave them, it was going to be performed. In other words, he was going to fulfill. He told them, and this was not a very pleasant thing, but he was going to tell them. He was going to fulfill it. He was, even, even the, if you want to look at it, if there is such a thing as a negative word, even the things, the curses that God speaks, they're going to come to pass. Not one jot or one tittle of anything God's ever said is going to fall to the ground. So if he says, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish, that's exactly what's going to happen. Amen. See, God's a fulfiller. He not only starts things, God does start a lot of things. In fact, he is the, the author, right, of our faith. He's, he's the one that we wouldn't have it had he not authored it in you. But see, he's also a finisher. He's a performer. The performance of the word. So now, what's he going to say to him? Well, obviously, don't under God's all his work, so he's worked this whole thing out. This is no mystery to God. This wasn't a surprise to God. God wants them to know. But see, they are really incapable of knowing a whole lot in this condition. They've fallen so far, God's going to have to spend 4,000 years to get man to where he can say, we're going to perform the mercy. Say, what are you talking about mercy? Only mercy they knew is they weren't consumed, right? God showed up. They had done what he said not to do, and he didn't consume them. So the, really, that's the that's basis of what you know about God? God's a lot bigger than that. God's going to perform mercy through taking away their sin, and, but they, they, weren't, they were able at the time to bear or to understand this word. So, see, God, what does he do? He's done to the woman. This is what he said to the woman. I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. This is what, because you've eaten this tree, because you did what I, I said not to do, there's some ramifications. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start something in motion here that is going to stay with you until you die, until the end of your time. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over you. This is the performance. Now, this is a performance of something that you would, man would say is negative. But see, actually, if you see it right, this is a positive. See, God's fencing them in now. Fencing them in now. You're going to hate your life here. I'm going to make your life here so hard, you're going to hate it. All right, now, what, what, what do you do when you hate life? When life just bears in on you? Well, let's see, if you're serious and you know there's a God, you'll call on the name of the Lord. Amen. You'll be able to see that he's a merciful God to some degree. All right, to the man, what does he say? Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. You're going to go to work and nothing's going to go right. It's not. I'm going to see to it that it's not. So I shouldn't be surprised. When I go to work and things don't work out, this should not be like a big mystery to me. Like, oh, woe is me. I'm living in a cursed world. And my, I'm a part of, now this is the important part, why I even started here. Because this is where God started, number one. But, but I started here because, see, we're linked. By nature, we're linked. These are our parents. We're reading about our parents here today. And this is what they did. They got the ball going by not doing what God said. And look at the ramifications of the performance of that evil. Look what it did. Now, see, we have to wrestle. Now, yeah, you got a new man in Christ Jesus, but now you, you, you're, it, you know, you're wrestling. What are you wrestling against? This old nature. Yeah. This part of you that says, I'm not going to do what God said. You're going to have to wrestle with it now. Now, the good news is, the good news is that Jesus showed up and performed the mercy. See, <laughs> you'd, have never, you'd have never been able to overcome that old man. You'd have lived your whole lifetime and never had any, any advantage over the flesh. You, you would have been, anything you did would have been futile against this nature that was against God. But see, Jesus showed up and he performed that mercy. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat of the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. 
for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. You ate of the tree that I said not to. And this is how serious God is about fulfilling his word. He said it, and it didn't fall to the ground. And Adam and Eve will stand up at the judgment, and they'll say God's true to his word. God was true to it. He didn't tell us something that didn't happen. Well, they could tell us about someone who did. There was someone that told them something that didn't happen, right? They ate of the tree, but did they become like God? They found out God really wasn't holding out on them. Satan was holding out on them. The performance. Now, actually, the performance of that word was never in question in heaven. Heaven never looked down and said, I wonder if he'll really do. No, that wasn't. Heaven knows what God's word is. Heaven knows the right reaction to have to God's word. But see, Lucifer had caused men to doubt that God was able to perform what he said. Do you take your mind off of, what did God say? We shall not surely die. No, that isn't what he said. Now see, as we look into the revelation that God's given us in the scripture, we find a perfect picture concerning his consistent nature and to always do or fulfill the things that he says. Always. See, he's given us a record from the very beginning all the way up till we see John on the Isle of Patmos. All the, the entire record is a complete and concise picture that God is true to his nature. He will not deny himself. He won't do it. It doesn't make any difference who you are. Even if you're his son hanging on a cross and he's laid sin on you, he'll turn, as it were, his face from you. This is God's nature. He will not turn from who he is. We can, this, is this is actually a point of great, great praise Amen. to God. When you see that God won't change, God's the same. He's, he's not going to change his mind. Now you can lay down your life that you might take it up again. See, this is, this is something that you, the, the saints of, of God, this is something they... They long to see God more clearly because they know He can be trusted. Amen. He can be trusted. His word can be trusted. It's not going to fall to the ground. Now, in a time of trouble, you can, like we've just seen today of a testimony, you can trust in something that He said Amen. because it won't fall to the ground. You can trust in it. Now, I'll just bring up one other example. <coughs> I bring this up because Jesus brought this up. Jesus talked a lot about um, these things that happened in the, in the old times, the ages. Now, Noah was a just man. Now, you know, a lot of people have given Noah, they don't understand what was going on there. Like Noah, you know, I heard one man say, Noah was out preaching to people. Well, who, who was he preaching to? The people that were going to be destroyed? Noah believed God, right? Well, I read where it said Noah believed the Lord. He, he did. Noah found grace. It starts, it starts off very interesting. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. But Noah's justice was not the reason he was saved. He, it tells you right there that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now see, Noah, his justness qualified him for the grace you see what I'm saying? He was just. He was perfect in his generation. So when God looks out into this whole generation of people, who's he going to give grace to? He's going to give it to Noah. Because he was perfect in his generation. You see how his, the fact that he was, he was true to what he understood and what he knew, he was righteous, made him the candidate, the one that God would favor in this time. God said to Noah, now look at what he gets. Why did, why did Noah get this? Because God had chosen him. Okay, now, now why did God choose him? Well, no, no, God are all his works. This is what he said to him. It's good to be close enough to the Lord that he prefers you to give the message to. This is what he said. God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Not the, uh, it, the, it might be the end of all flesh. I'm not really done thinking about this yet. No, I'm just going to let you in on it. He said, the end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, who's going to, who's, just knowing that much, if that's all you knew, 
who would you go preach to? It, having a word like that, who would you go alarm? God's going to destroy you. I mean, would that be the message? What else message could he give them? God's going to destroy you. God told me he's going to destroy you. That, that's the message that Noah had to preach. 120 years later, not even one person was added to the list that God gave Noah at that time. He said, you and those that you bring into the ark, your family. So God gives Noah, this is a hard message that God gave Noah. This is a very hard message. Although we have a very similar message, don't we? But see, our message, and I'm, I'm going to compare this message that Noah got. I'm going to destroy them all. All of them. And the message that we've been given, all right? We've been given a message that's been mixed with mercy, right? Now, we know, we know you, pre you go out and you preach the gospel. Them that believe, we have the option of, that they can believe. We have the option that, that people can actually change, that God can change people. Well, this is a lot different than the message. See, I, I'm all for letting people know the bad news. But see, if after you give them the bad news, if they're concerned and they're serious, we got some good news too. We don't, we don't just go home with, this, with the bad news. We got, God's able. He's spoken on that too, hasn't he? Anyway, moving along. He performed the mercy. He showed up 120 years later, and he did exactly what he told Noah he was going to do, and that was my point. That, that's God's point. That's Jesus' point when he says, in a time, just like the days of Noah, remember? Just like in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now you can take that many different directions. You can say that, that may, perhaps that means that we'll be living in a cursed generation where no one will be saved. But see, he holds out this mercy. He holds out to perform the mercy. We're living in a time of the open heavens, a time when grace has been demonstrated, openly demonstrated to principalities and powers in the heavenly place that God's merciful. And at the same time, just as the door of the ark was shut, there's coming a time when this age of mercy, this age of grace, it's going to come to a grinding halt. So see, this is the accepted time. Right now is the accepted time. Abraham shows up on the scene. <laughs> Abraham. He's, um, it's like you look back into the time before Abraham, all the way to the beginning of time, and it's like very, very sparse revelation. Something very, it's a little bit. And actually, if you didn't have any wisdom, if it wasn't you looking back, you having the Holy Spirit, you being in Christ, you walking in the Spirit, you look back and you see things that they couldn't understand. It's like, what does that mean? You're going to bruise his head and he's going to bruise your heel. What does that mean? But see, when you look at it, you say, oh, so it's, he's talking about the destruction of the devil. He's talking about the salvation of men, the taking away of sin. They wouldn't have got that out of that. It's like, what does that mean? But we get it. Now Abraham shows up and God's going to, God's like, like now nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show, I'm going to open up some things here. And if he's going to do it real time, if, if you know what I'm saying. He's going to do it as he works in the life of a man. As he shows him a little bit, he's going to do it through his word, the things that he said. He's going to bring them to pass. All right? He tells Abraham, you go out of your country into a land that you don't know. And he gives him some promises. Now I'm going to try to turn, make this shorter because I don't want it to be like six hours long. Abraham's given a promise right off the bat. God gives him a promise. What's God doing? God's establishing that when he says something, when he gives somebody a promise, that he'll fulfill that promise. He will. Now, there's conditions, right? It wasn't there conditions to Abraham? He said, oh, you just stay in your country, even though I want you to leave. It's a good suggestion. I'll suggest that maybe you should leave. No, he told him, you, you get out of your country, you get away from your people, and... Now, this is the condition, and if you do that, then what's God doing? God's teaching us. He's teaching the humanity, the whole, he's teaching us that he's, 
He's a God of promise, but these promises are based on conditions. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, okay, I'm just going to give them to you just in a rapid fire here. I'll make thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them to bless thee. I will curse them to curse thee. And these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's a lot of blessing, isn't it? That's a lot of things. Tells one man now, with all these blessings. So what did Abraham do? He departed. <laughs> now why would he do that? Because he believed the Lord. Abraham believed the Lord. Here you got the... He, never heard anything like this before. You, you do this. You leave. And you'll get all these... So Abraham departed. Now what's Abraham going to get? The, the conditions were met, right? Isn't that what... He, God said, you leave, and this is what I'll do. And he, I read it right here. It says, so Abraham departed. Now, I'm telling you, if, you're, if you believe that you're connected with Abraham... If you can see this, what he's talking about, you've got a lot of blessings attached to you. He said, I'll, let's just get to what he says. Some years later, he says, you look out there, he says, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed hereafter. Forever. Forever. Now, forever hadn't happened yet, so it's still in effect. It's still in effect, all right? I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. A little bit later, it says, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now what a thing to say to a man. But see, he obeyed the Lord. Okay, he accounted unto him for righteousness. He believed. All right, now see, God's working with a man in a way he's never worked with men before. Never. Why? Because he's demonstrating, I'm true to my word. Abraham left, and I made him the father of many nations. Right? Now, a little bit later, just look now towards heaven and tell the stars. Well, this is a man now that's getting... He, he, God's talking with him like he's more than a man. Because God's making him more than a man. Look at this. Tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. Now, this is getting big. This is getting real big. Because God's involved in it. God's demonstrating that he's, he's not limited in what he can give. The question is, is what we can believe of him. We believe the record that he's given. Well, then it's like it's unlimited what you can have from God. Amen. And he believed in the Lord. He believed in the Lord. Now, wasn't that the condition? <laughs> it was. He believed. And so what he says, he counted it to him for righteousness. He didn't have any righteousness of his own. He said his righteousness was just like ours. It's right. All the righteousness of humanity, if you put it all together in one basket, which it probably would fit in one basket, it'd be fil filthy rags. We're talking about compared to the righteousness of God now. So God sees Abraham. He sees that he believes. Ah. And he credits him for righteousness. You're righteous before me. All right, a little bit later, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to him, and this is what he said to him. I am the almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And Abraham didn't say, oh, that's so hard. He believed. This is what he did. He believed. Amen. Do you believe the record that God's given of his son? Then he's performed the mercy. It's, God's looking for hearts that believe the record. They actually believe it. I know this is hard to believe because <laughs> we're living in a time of unbelief. We're living in a time when believing is like on the way out. It's very rare for someone to actually stand up and say, I believe God. I believe Him. He says He made everything in seven days or six days. I believe He did it. He really did it. They say, that guy's weird. The time's going to come when he's going to be, that person's not going to be the weird one. I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. You walk with God, you'll be perfect. He'll make you perfect. I will make my covenant. Now, this is what he's talking about. We're finally getting to it now. But the, the point is, is that look at how God brought Abraham. He didn't tell Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans, I'm going to make my covenant with you. No, he told him, you get out of your country. We got to get out of Egypt. We got to get out of that country. We got to get away from the world if we're ever going to partake of this kind of... He's going to give him a blessing now that's going to require a performance of a mercy. Now, listen... 
I will make my covenant between me and thee. I will multiply thee exceedingly. Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. He told all this to Abraham. Now our text sums up and it says the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Zechariah says he's come to fulfill it. He's come. He, he's going to fulfill it. He's going to perform this oath that he promised to Abraham. Genesis twenty-two fifteen 15 says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing. Remember, he's just offered his son. In his heart, he, he, he sacrificed him in his heart and in his mind and in his will. Abraham sacrificed his son. Now, technically, he was stopped before the knife went in. But in his person, he did it. It was done. Yes. So this is God's response. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son. Yes. You didn't withhold him. You didn't say, well, maybe the Lord will change his mind. You went up on the mountain, and in your heart, you killed your son for me. That's how much you love me, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is upon the sea. And Zechariah said he's come to do it. He's come to perform the mercy that he promised to Abraham. He's going to do it now. He's like, this is not the time for sleeping. God's working. He said that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. God's going to do this thing. Now's the time. God's sent his son. Oh, I think this is happy. This is a happy day for Zacharias. It's a happy day. Amen. The seed of thy, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. It's going to happen. Now, now, you know, I say, well, wait a minute. Abraham died, and he didn't get all this, did he? He says, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Unto Isaac, and just bear with me here. Unto Isaac he said, I'll be with thee, I'll bless thee, I'll give unto, give unto thee and to thy seed, I'll give all these countries. I'll perform the oath which I swear to Abraham, thy father, I'll make thy seed to multiply the stars of heaven. I'll give unto you the seed of all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That's what he said unto Jacob. I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein thou liest to thee will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. It shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee... And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all the places where thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. Now you can examine it, but there was no new promise given to Isaac or Jacob. Everything was linked to Abraham's performance. Amen. What he did. He believed me. He did what I told him. This is what he said. He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That's what God hinged the fulfillment or the performance of the mercy on that. <laughs> In other words, he said this was a valid reason for him to send Jesus to take away sin. It's what it was. He promised to date my covenant. I made a covenant with him that I would do these things, and now my son's here to do them. He's going to do them. I'll perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Zacharias, being full of the Holy Ghost, links these two things together. Yeah. It's what he does. 
it shouldn't surprise us, the performance of the mercy couldn't be done by anyone but Jesus. Yeah. Couldn't. There wasn't anybody else that could do this work. Right. So see, the, the very fact that God inspired or, 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 or brought Zacharias to the place through the Holy Spirit to say this was a confirmation that the promise, that the, the, the things that he promised to, to Abraham, in essence, couldn't be fulfilled by anyone other than Jesus personally. The only eternal resolution of the magnitude of the promise given to Abraham had to have its final fulfillment in Christ for it to, to he had to do it. He had to sacrifice himself. Yes. To all the implications that Abraham didn't see the implications, he knew there was something. We know this. I'm not just making this up. This is what it says, Hebrews 11:9. By faith he sojourned in the land as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs of him on the same promise. For Abraham's stance was eternal towards heaven. See, he, he was looking for something that he couldn't find down here. For he looked, talk about Abraham, for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham looked for something that extended beyond this life. Now the writer of Hebrews links this truth that Abraham looked further than what he could naturally see. See, it was faith. It was by faith. All right, so what he says, all these, talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. That's what it says. Now, Zacharias says, this, it's here now. The fulfillment of the promise is here now. See, the, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, right? Amen. See, he's going he's gonna to make it to where your whole lifetime, you're not, you're not fearing death. How many, of, how many of those that are in Christ are fearing death today? They're just on the dread, oh, I'm going to have to die. The ones that I talk to, they can't wait to die. They can't wait. It isn't that the way would be separated isn't it that they would be not without, but that they would be joined to the Lord. You see, this is, see what I'm saying? They're not afraid of death anymore. He's, he's done it. He's performed the mercy. In our text, the Lord's, it's like he's taking off the blinders. He's opening up what is really meant by being delivered out of the hands of our enemies. What does that really mean? Well, you get into Christ and you'll find out, I've been delivered. It doesn't matter if they throw me in jail at midnight. See, they don't, he could, Jesus said, you could have no power over me at all. At all, except that we're given to you. So see, that, that's called being delivered out of the hands of your enemies. That's a real deliverance. Well, I'm just going to sum this up here. The prophet spoke about a, a new day. We're talking about this new covenant, this new his holy covenant. That's exactly what it is, too. It's a holy covenant. The, the apostles, they spoke about a new and a living way, remember? The prophet spoke about a day or an appointed time when God would bring in a new or an everlasting covenant. Isaiah 31, if you read through that, it, it was, this is a new, this is new. Nothing like this ever existed before. This was something that new, God was going to do something new. I mean, you look through it, and it's a new covenant. This is a new way. Yeah, you're, you're on this side of the cross. You actually have the new, new covenant working inside of you. You have a new heart. You got this, new, this newness of life. What happened? He performed the mercy. Amen. See, we look, at, we look back, and, and sometimes I think I take it for granted that I can understand some of these things. They couldn't understand it because they weren't, they weren't on this side of the cross. They were on the other side. Zacharias, it's like, it's like he saw the line of demarcation when the old was going to be old and the new was coming and this new. I want to say it one last time that Zacharias linked these two things together. That being full of the Holy Ghost... He's linked the fulfillment of those same promises that were promised to Abraham. 
He's linked them with the coming of the Messiah. Okay, this is what, this is what would flower out from this coming of the Messiah. All right, Jesus would fulfill all the law and the prophets. He would fulfill them all. He would take away sin. Jesus would be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus would bring in everlasting righteousness. Jesus would fulfill the law and make it honorable. He would be betrayed by one of his own. Every single prophecy that ever was prophesied would be fulfilled. See, I'm talking about the Christ, the Messiah. It would be fulfilled. He would do it all. He would perform the mercy. He would keep the feet of his saints. He would. Remember in John 17? While they were with me, I kept them. All right? He, in the end, he would destroy the devil. Jesus would do this. This one that would come and, and um, Jesus would bring many sons to glory. That's what he would do. That's what... All right, now Jesus was raised from the dead to die no more. He says that in Revelation 1. Jesus would be exalted higher than the heavens. He'd be given a name which is above every name. Jesus is the fulfillment of what Zacharias is talking about. Jesus would send the Holy Spirit to comfort his people. He would be a faithful and a merciful high priest in things pertaining to God. He would rule in the midst of his enemies. He would rule in the midst of his people. He would empower his people to overcome every temptation. He would make a way of escape. Now, Jesus is doing this. Jesus would rebuke the adversary and get the resources to, to the people in time for them to overcome sin. You know how critical that is? You know how critical it is in the time of temptation that you get the resource right when you need it in order for you to overcome that temptation. Jesus would do this. See, Jesus would do this. Jesus will come again in power and great glory. He'll finish the faith of all those who trust in him. Jesus has in the past... We, we can see, we're looking back, we can see Jesus actually was the fulfillment of the, of the law. Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that God said that was just and right and good. Jesus is it. Jesus is presently performing the mercy promised to our fathers. See, right now, right now we're living in a time of the performance of this mercy. Amen. And yet that's not all. See, in the ages to come, when we get there, we're sitting seated with him in heavenly places. I mean, really seated with him. He'll continue to perform the mercy. He, he's not going to stop being Jesus in glory. He's always going to be the one that we relate to God through him. Without Jesus, there really is no performance of any mercy. Mercy can't be promised to anyone who ever had the status of sinner independent of Jesus. It can't happen. So, I'll close with this, Romans eleven thirty six. 36. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forevermore. Amen. He's the one that performed the mercy. Amen. Thank you, brother.